From Hong Kong, Chicago and the city of Stoke-on-Trent, this is the Classic Lenses Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 90. My name is Simon Forster and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Hello, Johnny. Hello, good morning. And hello, Perry. Hello, good evening. Right, we've got a guest this week. It seems like ages since we actually had a guest that's not a guest host um, or somebody that we've dragged in to read haikus. Um, so we have with us uh, a chap known as W.S. Pavetta, or as we're going to be calling him today, Bill Pavetta. So hello, Bill. Good morning, guys. It's great to have you here, Bill. And uh, just give a, a quick bit of uh, background on Bill. Um, back in, well, back at the, I think it was January, actually, uh, the episode 50, actually, episode 50, we should have had uh, Matthew Duclos uh, on the show and he didn't set his alarm properly and he missed the show um, and then he came back a couple of weeks later I think back in episode 52 and we did a lot of conversations about cine lenses and round about that time as well Bill had got in touch with us to say hey if you want to talk about cine lenses and so we had uh, you know two people vying to uh, chat to us about cine lenses and uh, um, Matthew at the time got the gig largely because he also had a Carl Zeiss 50mm f0.7 lens to talk about so yeah he got he got the bragging rights there um, but we um, we did say at the time that we wanted to have Bill on as well uh, because there were quite a, there were a lot of topics that were covered in that show there were a lot of things that weren't covered in that show and uh, Bill is somebody that knows uh, quite a bit about the subject and he was he was wanting to talk about these other things and uh, we we just didn't get round to it with uh, lots of the events that uh, that happened in the early part of this year and we finally have got Bill on the show um, so it's 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 great to have you with us here Bill and uh, Bill in particular is uh, he described himself as a as a as a sound man but he's also been a cinematographer for a very long time and you can even find him on IMDB which uh, always impresses me so uh, welcome to the show Bill thanks guys I, I really appreciate it uh, like I say if you would have told me a year ago that I, I'd be on the classic lenses podcast with Simon Johnny and Perry I wouldn't have believed it seriously so it is such a great honor and a pleasure to be here and uh, I hope I can match up to all of your previous great guests well, it's 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 great to have you on, and I I, I feel like I should apologise about how long it's actually taken us to to, to get you on here. So, yeah, so. exactly. We we kept talking about when we wanted to have a really good cine discussion, you know, and it was like, oh, I'm not sure if we're up for it yet. <laughs> so no, it's definitely great. worth the wait. Yeah, it's well, that's for us too. Well, the other the other part to that as well is that since we actually did that episode, it seems like the the world of mm -hmm. using <laughs> cine film in stills cameras is, is just exploded i mean there was uh, cine stills out there and all that kind of stuff but loads there's, there's loads of people that are using uh black and white cine film they're bulk loading it into cameras and uh, and also dealing with uh, weird stuff like remjet uh, on on color film so yeah the, it seems like the the world has changed a little bit since last time so that's i think that's an even even better reason to, to have you on i'm glad we've left it a little bit so we can actually talk about those topics as well because we probably wouldn't have even spoke about those things back then um so i'm thinking now just to give our listeners a better idea about who you are bill um perhaps you could give us a bit of a rundown of uh of how you got to where you are now on this show but how you got into photography the kind of stuff that you do whether it be stills or in the movies and things like that yeah oh sure well like like you mentioned um my day job right now, I'm a sound mixer for films. So I'm the guy that uh, records dialogue for the movie, you know, either on location or on a set. And, uh, but I've actually been in the film business about my whole life. You know, like everybody else, probably when I was 13, is when I really got interested in it, which was many, many years ago. But uh, my father was a documentarian of the family. And one day he just handed over the Super 8 movie camera to me and said, you're doing it from now on. And that was kind of the beginning. And I also bought my first uh, little tape recorder from Radio Shack back in the 60s and realized that I also love to record sound. So my whole life I've been chasing after images and sounds. And I'm, I just want to say this right off the bat. I'm not a I don't have a huge 
uh, social media presence, really. I don't post things. I don't post pictures. I've spent most of my life actually helping other people achieve their dreams. And, and that's what I love to do. Like I said, I've been an assistant cameraman. I've been a, a DP. You know, I've worked on seven full length features and dozens of short films and that kind of stuff. Uh, but, but basically what makes me happy is to help other people out. So for instance, uh, I happen to be part of a very large company here, Asheville camera grip and lighting. We've got about 5,000 square feet of gear. And uh, whenever uh, they need a lens or whenever they need sound support, you know, I'm on it because that's what I, I like to do the most is help other people out. Yes, I do a lot of personal photography. Like say I've shot eight by 10, four by five. I've got three Hasselblads. I don't even want to get into how many cameras I own. There's like too many. I think I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to have a camera for each day of the year. So I could take one picture <laughs> on each camera and I'm getting close. <laughs> I, I don't think you can. And I'm not that kidding. Hammers. That's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but basically, also, oh, I probably should mention too that uh, I'm a retired Air Force photographer. So I've had a lot of good experiences. I've pulled, uh, I don't know, seven and a half G's. And yes, I did throw up while we were doing that. And uh, I've flown all over the world photographing jet planes and, you know, climbing in engines. A lot of times they would send me into an engine to uh, document a bird strike that had destroyed one of the titanium veins in the, in the jet engine. So I've had 20 years of that, which was really a lot of fun. And then to add to the, uh, and, and cut me off when you want to, but no, to no, add, no, to, please go ahead. Go. Okay. Uh, not only I, I teach at, I'm an adjunct at, at, many colleges. Uh, and also one of the big things I do is, and you guys are probably all too young and I'm hoping you know what this is, but a Steenbeck, I'm a Steenbeck technician and Johnny, that's where I started learning my Steenbeck, uh, skills was in Chicago, huh. right there on Washington Avenue. Oh, okay. And, oh yeah. yeah that's there. Yeah. There used to be a SMS. huge mess. Yeah. Right. Sure. Oh, man, man, son, my fa one of my favorite guys on earth was man, son. Wow. And uh, a, a, a Steenbeck is a flatbed film editor. And that way you can edit picture and sound. And if you look at a current NLE, uh, for instance, Premiere or, or Final Cut or whatever, they were actually designed after a Steenbeck. A Steenbeck has two, two pictures or one. And then it has soundtracks. And they're all on a, on a flat table. And you can sync all those together and watch your film and edit it in sync. Uh, very few people repair those now. I think there's only maybe five of us left. So I'll claim wow. to be number five. Wow. I don't want to be number one, but we all made a pact. Uh, whoever survives in the end gets everybody else's stuff. And <laughs> that's kind of scary because I've, I've got one of the largest parts departments for Steenbeck in the South United States. Wow. So I do a lot of traveling to different universities because, believe it or not, they still use those in their uh, film programs because, uh, you know, it's a good way to learn how, how lucky you are now with digital. <laughs> uh, <laughs> editing on film is very difficult but very satisfying at the same time. So uh, I do that too. But really my big thing is, and, and here you go, I'm going to admit to an addiction, you know what I'm going to say. I love lenses and I, I don't know what to do. I can't stop buying them. I mean, I, I, I haven't met a lens I don't love. I don't sell lenses. I mean, I think out of 250 lenses, I might have gotten rid of three. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here in my office right now surrounded by cameras and lenses, and they're all looking at me like, well, what do you want to do with me? Because um, that is the problem. Let's face it. When you're on a set, you're on a movie, you can only use one lens at a time. So I don't care how many lenses you have. You know, you still you still have to know that lens that you're using. And that's what just turns me on the most is that uh, I love playing with lenses. I love looking at the actual field of view that they give me on the particular camera. I love a milky look from a lens made in the 40s. Um, I'm not I don't own many modern cinema lenses. I do. But most of mine are classics and vintage. And, th and that's where I come in as the most important thing probably in my life right now is just being a curator of, of all of this gear. Well, the question that, that immediately jumps to my mind is if you've sold three lenses, what were they and why? 
Well, they were all <laughs> actually they weren't two of them I gave away. And I, you know, I don't know if I've ever sold a lint. I just can't do it. And I figure after I'm gone, there's whatever. I don't know where they're going to go. Like I say, I'm, I've got uh, a lot of people say that I have a museum and, and, and I, I really think I do. Uh, like I say, I've got maybe 10 film cameras here. And by the way, 99% of everything I have works. So not only am I a collector, but I'm also a technician. And uh, I have a very valuable connection to a company near Cleveland, Ohio, called Visual Products. And they are the guys that actually got me started on this 30 years ago. So I've had 30 years of lens collecting. And there were days where the owner of that company would say, Bill, you really should buy a set of super speeds. And we could talk about what super speeds are later. Oh, no. you, you really <laughs> should buy a set. They're only 12 grand. And I said, Jim, ah, oh, man, I don't have 12 grand. Okay. Fast forward to now. Those are $80,000 uh -huh. for a proper set of super speeds from the 70s. And uh, so that, that's what I did. I just started ending up collecting entire sets. And the crazy thing about cinema lenses you know, in opposition to still lenses is that you need a lot of accessories with cinema lenses. You know, not only do you have the lens, but you've got focus gears on it and you've got a follow focus unit and you've got map boxes, you have filters, and you have lens support. And there's just an awful lot of stuff for each lens. And so that makes me even crazier because not only am I an expert collector, but I love having original accessories with it. So the lens caps have to be original or at least the best I can do. I mean, I know that's compulsive, but what can I say? Well, do you, I th well, you're in good company here, especially with Perry. Uh, uh -huh. He doesn't like to use the wrong color lens on on a particular kind <laughs> yeah. of camera. Uh, and I hate to tell you, I do that all the time, but I'll I'll try to change, Perry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what else can I add to it? But yeah, like I say, uh, and what we could talk about today is is that I do a lot of lens modifications. So you could take oh yes, a stills lens, and you can convert it. And there are many ways to do it, from very cheap to very expensive. And I've I've been all of those routes, so I can pretty much answer any question wow. um, cool. about converting those lenses or, or or even where to find them. The problem with cine lenses is, like all lenses, the prices have increased so much. That even I, I think the last lens I bought might have been about six months ago, and I can't hardly believe that I got it. But we're talking into three, you know, six thousand dollars for a lens. Wow! And yeah. that just keeps a lot of people out of it. So I figured, well, if you want to use a nice stills lens on a decent digital cinema camera, there are many ways to do it. I mean, everybody knows that already. But many adapters, man. When I was a kid. Back then, we had 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter film. The lenses were specific to the cameras, and that was it. Nowadays, with with all the different adapters that are available cheaply, I might add, the options have increased tremendously. And that's even better because I've got, you know, like I say, 50 lenses that'll fit on on seven different cameras here. And you know, you could do the reverse too. You could use cinema lenses on still camera, but not usually the same there there's really no reason for that because there's so many good lenses out there but there is a good reason to use still lenses on video if i can give you a for instance uh we've got a local camera store here in Asheville, which is also uh an addiction and uh it's in there i don't know maybe four months ago and in a i opened a case and inside was a 19 I'd say late 60s Spiratone. I don't know if you all remember that name. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. sure. 18 millimeter lens, brand new, never been touched. And it was in a T2 mount. So that it's a it's a different kind of a screw mount. And yeah. you, can use, you probably know all that stuff. So it was in a T2 mount. And what I did was I bought a PL mount so that I could convert that immediately to my digital cameras. But I sent it into visual products. They put it on their uh, uh, bench, and they, they got it all lined up so it's perfect. They declicked it. They put a focus gear on it, and uh, then they, they projected it through a projector so they could check sharpness. Then they sent it back to me. They didn't charge me a cent. I don't know why. I think they love me. And that whole deal, <laughs> that whole deal cost me $42. Wow. Yeah, nice. and it is the most gorgeous image. We threw that lens on a red epic, maybe a 5K red epic, and it just blew everybody's mind how good it looks. 
But that's not always the case. A lot of times a still lens will look terrible on digital and and reverse then for still. I've got a lot of lenses that are beautiful on black and white. And then I put them on my red camera or my black magic camera and they're just flat, dull and ugly. So it's kind of one of those things where you have to keep searching until you find the right look. And to me, that's the most exciting thing about lenses and optics and photons is, is getting that right look. Uh, so, Bill, yes, you you mentioned that you use still lenses on uh, cinema cameras all the time, and not so much the other way round. Um, but have you done it the other way round? Because I'd have quite a few questions about doing it that way. Uh, well, it's 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 yeah, that's a great great question. It, it's harder to convert a cinema lens to a still camera mount than it is the other way around. And a lot of that uh-huh. has, has to do with the flange focal distance, and that kind of stuff. So, um, but yes, I have. But the other thing is in the world of cine lenses, they're, they're meant to cover, I'm looking up a chart here. They're meant to cover uh, different formats. Yes. So a lens that's made for a 16 millimeter camera has a smaller exit pupil. Mm. On that. Yes. So it only covers a, a 16 millimeter frame to yes. where uh, a 35 millimeter lens and, and nowadays even bigger, uh, f- you know, that would cover 8K and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, they would work. Now, the problem is that it's really hard to. Well, no, I take that back. You can actually convert PL mounts to micro four thirds very easily. As you guys know, micro four thirds is the easiest mount to convert any lens to because uh, it only has a 20 millimeter flange to where a PL camera has a 52 millimeter flange distance. So that's huge difference. So that means that I could not use a micro fourth, you know, a smaller lens on a PL, but I can go the other direction. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is something that is huge in Hong Kong and I have been somewhat obsessed with lately. Um, But just to clear a couple of things up for listeners, uh, the, the Super 35 format that a lot of cine lenses are designed for, that's roughly the size of APS-C, right? Uh, it's close. It's yes, wider. it is. Yes. It's wider in its aspect ratio, but approximately. Yeah, because let's see. Um, a Super 35 frame is 24.89 millimeters by 18.66 millimeters. Uh-huh. And, okay. And the... Uh, I've got it right here. The eight, uh, the uh, APS-C is 22.2 by 14.8. So they're pretty close. Okay. Um, so there are some lenses that I think are designed for Super 35, but have a slightly larger image circle that yes. they either almost or some, in some cases do cover uh, either a film sensor or a full frame sensor. Um, because I think... Uh, there are people who convert those. So so a few that I want to ask about in particular. I just missed out the other day by one minute because I was taking a nap. Uh, <laughs> an, an eBay auction on a Soviet cine, cine lens, a Helios 33 35 millimeter F2 uh, that was converted to Leica M mount. And to me, the results of cinema lenses when I see them, like, e- even like this Soviet one, when I see them used on stills cameras, they look quite different. Uh, so I'm wondering, A, whether you have any experience of that lens, or if not, the the ones that I'm really trying to stop myself from playing with are uh, the vintage Cook Speed Pancros. Ah, oh, now you're talking my language. <laughs> um, yes, well, as, as you know, you probably know, um, cinema lenses really were meant to... Um, use be used with film and so the film plane was you know organic and there's grain and it's going through the camera and that sort of stuff with today's modern flat digital sensors the light comes in at a because the cinema lenses are kind of curved a lot curvier and uh-huh. so the light comes in at different angles and that's why you might have you know color fridging or out of focus edges or something like that but definitely yes uh, the cinema lens has a much or, or vintage Cinema lens has a much more organic look than a modern, say, Rokinon lens. So, yeah. and that makes a huge difference in, in the uh, the actual image. And and here's the thing: I try to talk to most of my 
the people that I work with, they all have sets of modern lenses and they don't have cooks, but they have Rokinons and that kind of stuff. And they look pretty good. They really do. And when you project them on a big screen, they look pretty good. But when you shoot something with a classic lens and you do a side-by-side -side comparison, well, there is no comparison. It's so beautiful. And a lot of that, that depends on the, the lens itself, the actual you know, think about it. The cook lenses that you just mentioned, I have some from the 40s. So those were all handmade. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the glass was, was you know, hand ground and, and it's just an amazing thing. And yes, if you've got a, um, what, what Russian lens did you have? It's a, oh no, it's, I missed out on the auction by one minute and it sold at a price. It sold for 255 US dollars. Yeah, that's, uh, that's normal. I, I, uh, I would happily have paid because this one was, um, converted to like an M mount with rangefinder coupling, which is why I got it, wow. uh, which is why I wanted it because normally you can get them from cheaper. But yeah, that's a 35 millimeter F2 uh, that I think just about covers a full frame sensor. Yeah. Helios 33. Yeah. Well, I have uh, one, two, three, four. Five. I have about 14 Russian lenses mm -hmm. and all of them cover, including uh, my beloved Helios 44 2. I have four of those. Mm hmm. And, uh, but they all cover, uh, super 35 and larger actually. So but, yeah, you missed out. That sounds like a good deal, but there's plenty more out there on Russian lenses. Yeah. Yeah. It's gotta be patient. Right. But the, on the cook speed pancros, uh, they, they revive that line of lenses. Yes. Uh, so can you, can you talk a little bit about the difference between, the old vintage ones because here in hong kong you often find them just as the optical cell uh right. with the app which at with the aperture control which people then convert uh to whatever mount they want to use it on for digital or film um but yeah do you know do you know what the difference is between the new sort of remounted i think most of them are for for re right yeah the, yes yeah, airy and and the PL mount PL by the way stands for positive lock. It's a mount that they came up with, you know, a long time ago. Um, actually, right now you can the optical cell that you just mentioned actually is very valuable. The problem is you can't do a lot with that unless you have that rehoused, and mm -hmm. that could be several thousands of dollars. As a matter of fact, I have a um, eighteen point five ingenue. 18.5 millimeter ingenue lens, which was, um, uh, hold on a second. That lens was used in Touch of Evil. Uh huh. And uh, a fantastic lens. Well, if you have four thousand uh, dollars, zero optics out in LA will can will take that lens cell and put it in a new body, and that new body will have focus gears. And, you know, the proper T-stops are marked. Uh, it'll have a standard, uh, probably a 114 millimeter front so that it fits, you know, a matte box easily. But that's $4,000. Now, that being said, I could take that same 18.5 that I own now. It's in an Airy S-mount, and I have a Airy PL mount converter. I could just put that right on my RED camera and get the same exact image that that four thousand dollar lens will. So really, what you're paying for is just the rehousing. The glass it hasn't changed. If anything, they try to clean that up for you, mm. which so, can be less desirable. Yeah, I mean, I I like the fact that, for instance, I also picked up a fourteen point five millimeter lens last time I was at Visual Products. And uh, it is so milky and it has a scratch on the rear element. But when you put it on to a professional digital cinema camera, oh my God, the image just knocks you over. Uh, it's all flary and it just makes people look beautiful and just, you know, it's amazing. But yet that lens was rejected probably by a ton of people because I had a scratch. And I, I honestly don't see it. I think if anything, it adds to the character uh -huh. of that lens. But most yeah. certainly, go ahead. No, no I was going to say that that resonates so much because um, I've, I recently I went on this little bit of a spree where I've been shooting a ton of cinema film and, and cine still in, in particular. And uh, there was one week when I went out and shot with one of my old uncoated uh, Chioko Super Rokers. Mm. And the, the sort of low contrast look... Um, made it so well with that cinema film that I went out and basically tested every LTM mount uh, 50 millimeter that I had. 
And <laughs> one of my favorite performers was an old Topcore uh, 5CM F3.5 Tessar that was just scratched to all hell on the front element. And I had never thought anything of that lens before because I just bought it because it was cheap and I wanted to fiddle around with it. But then when I actually used it, my reaction was, this is closer to the look that I want than a lot of, you know, the the cleaner, nicer uh, lenses that are in my collection. Yeah, that, that's exciting. Actually, that's that's the way I am, too. I'll, I'll buy them because they're cheap and I just want to fool around with them. But sometimes you're pleasantly surprised at the results. Not always, but a lot of the times. Yeah. So the uh, the the new rehoused cook speed pancros that you can buy from cook um are those basically the same optics as the 1940s vintage lenses no actually the new lenses actually cook redesigned the pancros twice they came out with a line i think about five years ago and it failed nobody wanted them and then with the changing world of cinematography now everyone wants the classic look they brought them back again so those are new glass now they may be and i don't have this information for sure but they may be designed after the same optical formulas and 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 they're, they're just gorgeous I mean, cook lenses i think are probably the, the most gorgeous lenses on earth um but the the rehouse lenses actually are done by different companies uh particularly in in england there i think it's TRS or TLS, I forget, mm -hmm. where they rehouse cook lenses and they just use the old glass and they put it in a new body. And I prefer that. Although if someone were to give me a set of cooks for what, $90,000, I would take them. Yeah. But uh, uh, personally, I think that you could still get these looks for a lot cheaper. Th and that's usually my goal is to come up with these looks on a cheaper. I realize we could just buy a set. Uh, if you ever check out uh, visualproducts.com, they have lots of sets there of rehoused lenses. You're going to be shocked by the prices. And that's because it's become so popular. Like I say, if I would have been, I've been collecting for 30 years, but I kind of wish I, I had bought more now that I think about it because it's an excellent <laughs> it's an excellent investment. I mean, it truly is. It's like having a house or land. I mean, the price just keeps going up. Now that's bad for people that want to buy them, but it's good for people that have them and need to get rid of them. Yeah, I, I feel that way all the time. <laughs> I mean, some sometimes the prices just shoot up within a span of weeks, and you just you know sometimes I see this happening, and I'm just trying to figure out what happened. Which celebrity talked about this? What YouTube video got posted that is just making the prices of these things skyrocket? Oh, that's true. You know what? There are so many videos on YouTube now about lens conversions. Some of them are pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who don't know what they're talking about. There are some really good ones out there that talk about conversions. And especially one of my favorite and most easy to convert are, are the Pentax M42. Uh -huh. uh, they are available everywhere. I just picked up a... Uh, a uh, 150 mil, I forget which one it is. I think it's the eight element 150. So it's it's really rare. Is it a 150? I'd have to go look. But anyhow, the M42 mount is easiest because there's tons of PL mount converters. So I could just, and they just screw right on. So you just screw that thing on and boom, you've got a Pentax Takamar on your Blackmagic or whatever camera that has a PL mount. And um, you have the luxury then of having the entire set of everything I own that's M42 fits my camera. I mean, the choices are massive. It's just unbelievable. So, and I just, I picked up a 300 mil Pentax preset lens a few weeks back, put an M42 to PL mount, or I'm sorry, an M42 to EF mount and the guys are using it uh, for just one shot, you know, but they need that one beautiful, long 300 millimeter, gorgeous 1970s vintage lens look. And there you go. It's perfect. Put it on the camera, shoot and go. And you can do that because of the ease of all the uh, adapters that are available these days. Just a wonderful thing. You know, one of the things that strikes me is when I hear cinematographers speak um, what you said just now about, you know, picking up and converting a lens for one shot. When I hear cinematographers speak about their process, it strikes me that they seem to put way more thought than at least certainly I would into what specific lens they're going to use uh, for a specific sequence. How, how, how does that decision process even 
work? Is it purely experimentation? Well, not actually. No, on a movie, the DP, the director of photography, calls the lenses. I mean, mm -hmm. they're the ones. They, they say, I want a 50. You know, I want it, you know, on baby legs here in the corner aimed up or whatever. But, but the DP calls the lens. And normally you experiment with and or talk about the set of lenses you're going to use for that movie before the movie starts. And okay. most of the time, like I say, the younger guys that I work with, they'll go with their, their newer uh, roken on stuff. I mean, those lenses are only five or 600 bucks a piece. So you can have a whole set of lenses fairly cheap, but I'm starting to work my way into their brains with the fact that there's more to cinematography than just getting the really good shot. And by the way, those Rokinons look great. Again, they're super sharp, nice contrast, all that, but they, they lack something. Now, not all the time, but most of the time I still feel cheated when I look at that image. Cause I think, man, if they would have used my cook, 18 millimeter speed pancro on that yeah. same shot. I think it would have made a huge difference. And uh, so I'm going to keep working, working and willing away at these guys to, but, but again, yes, the, if you have the time, it's, it's nice to experiment ahead of time. And that's basically what I do. Uh, if I may say uh, again, for visual uh, every once in a while, they'll send me a lens or a camera to test out and I will shoot, uh, either digital or 16 mil. Matter of fact, I'm shooting with a 16 millimeter camera this week for them. And then I'll put it up on Vimeo. And then when someone wants to buy the camera, they can go and look at that image. And uh, so it's, it's great fun when they, they just send the lens for whatever reason and just, just try it out. And uh, I love it. I, I love the fact that, uh, you know, the angle of view and how it looks in that particular camera with that particular lighting. I mean, you can just spend the rest of your life figuring this stuff, figuring all these little things out. So how how do you get on with consistency of looks though? Because you, you've you've mentioned there that particular lens and it, and it would look particularly good in in certain circumstances and it's a certain focal length, and then there's a scene change. Yes. How how about the continuity of look between lenses between shots? How is how is that managed? It well, it means a lot these days, and that's why the uh, the sets of matched lenses. You know, if you buy a set of Cooks, you buy a set of Zeiss, whatever, uh, they're going to be matched coatings. And that's a great question because I've got a multitude of coatings and sometimes no coatings at all. So I would never change the lens in the middle of a scene. We, we'd have to keep consistent that way. So um, a lot of times, but if you go from scene to scene or you, you switch from indoor to outdoor and that kind of stuff, and you want to have that look, it's not as noticeable, but, but definitely you need to have coatings and color matching. Now I have a couple sets, full sets of Nikors, and I can put Canon EF mounts on those and they match up pretty nicely because they're all AIS lenses. So they all have the same generation of coatings. I mean, there's little differences here and there, but you can really see the difference. And it's such a great point that you brought up because of the different coatings. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference in terms of contrast and all that stuff. Now, are you are you mating the uh, the film and the lighting and the lens together? Or um, would you typically decide to, you know, prioritize one? Because I was listening to a podcast recently where they were interviewing the cinematographers uh, who did Joker, the Joker movie. Mm -hmm. um, and they were talking about how they originally wanted it to shoot. Uh, they wanted originally wanted to shoot it on film. Um, I can't remember which film stock. It was a Kodak 50. Something. Yeah. There, there's only a couple left. There's a 250 D yeah. and a 500 T. So, so they didn't, they didn't have budget for it. Um, so what they did was they created a color LUT yep. to kind of simulate that film. Yep. And then uh, they they used all the same family of lenses for their uh, Ari Alexa. Of course. And essentially, the a lot of the, the sort of color work was done with the lighting and that color LUT. And apart from grading, it was kind of minimal. Um, there, there's less to do after the fact because you have a fairly consistent look in yes. advance. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do that all the time. We'll throw a LUT on the camera so we can see what it's going to look like in, in final edit. And that really helps, really helps uh, a lot. For our, for our listeners sake, um, can you explain what a color LUT is and how that well, works? It stands for lookup table. And uh, basically 
for instance, I could take with my original, I own an original Red One camera. That's the camera that started it all. Huh. Uh, they were made in 2006, mine's a 2007. A lot of my students always ask, wow, did your grandfather give you that camera? <laughs> <laughs> And it's it's the best. And what you could do with that is I could create my own LUTs by actually taking a still with that camera, putting it on a little SD card, taking it out, stick it in the computer, do all my adjustments in Resolve or Premiere or whatever L uh, NLE I'm using at the time, do any color corrections I want, put that back on the discs, put the disc back in the camera, and from then on the camera will actually shoot at what I had programmed in on that LUT. Now, I don't know how to really explain modern LUTs in terms of like with black magic cameras, but I know we've got a whole series of those and we're on location. I'll hear the DP or, or the, you know, the director, or whatever asked to put that specific LUT on there and they can see what it's going to look like. And it just makes life easier. And, uh, so, and there are many programs out there that you could create your own and you could even buy them, which I think is interesting because I would love to have a set of LUTs that look like, say, Technicolor back in 1940. Uh -huh. And I just never really pushed it that far to do that because I pretty much create my own image. And, uh, but, but it makes for even more excitement how nice it is to be able to shoot digital. And don't get me wrong. I love film. I still shoot film. Like I say, it's not every day, but I uh, shoot, I've been shooting 35 millimeter motion picture film since I was in my early twenties. And I still teach classes every once in a while where we actually use film. Then we transfer it to digital from there. We don't actually go into film editing. Um, but the the definitely digital is cheaper for sure. <laughs> That's why most people do it. Uh, but there are certain things about film that you you know just the smell of it. You know you can't smell digital. So but you you have a can of film in your changing bag and ah, it's just like doesn't get any better than that. I've got a, a, a question, and I do want to head down into the um, into a bit of a film discussion. But before we we, we head there and uh, staying with the digital, uh, I saw uh, Joker uh, last week or the week before, and I, I you know, the cinematography on that I was I was knocked out by. I just oh, thought it was, it was just beautiful. Um, but I was watching that film, and I was thinking, oh, I so hope this is shot on film. Um, because it, it felt like it was shot on film to me. Um, obviously, I've, well, I say obviously, I've subsequently learned that it, it wasn't uh, shot on film and then, then this LUT uh, was, was was used uh, to mimic, I, I think it mimicked yes. film. But as a, as a cinematographer, do you look at these films not knowing if, when you go into a film and, and then you look at it and think, well, I think that's using a lot, or I think that's shot on film. Would, can you can you tell the difference? Could you have gone into Joker and seen that as being digital, made to look like film, or or not? Well, back in the day, I could pick them out right away. I knew it. Now it's a lot tougher. That the the just the the sensors and the the beautiful airy uh, minis and all the stuff that they're using these days. It, it's really hard to tell. I'm trying to think, the last film that I saw that was actually shot. The title has escaped me, but it's actually shot on digital and film. And it's almost hard to tell the difference now. And, uh, but truly it's harder, it's harder and harder to tell these days. I'm sure there are some ways you could look maybe in the shadows or contract, micro contract, whatever. But I, I think that as digital progresses, it just gets better and better and, and may at many instances, you know, I hate to say this, but it might surpass film. So basically you use film because that's the look you want, not because it's better than digital or worse than digital. None of that stuff matters. It's always yeah. about what do you want to, what do you want it to look like? Uh, and, you know, I think everybody knows that nowadays too. I mean, people are so much smarter these days. Um, so again, like I say, for me, that field of view, that combination of the lens and the sensor and what you're actually seeing in the viewfinder along with the coatings or lack thereof, to me is the most exciting part of creating an image and, and just you know putting a series of images together. I think I've spent m most of my life just testing lenses, to be honest with you. I, f I find that just so terrifically exciting that <laughs> I could just end up doing that, which is kind of boring really because we need to make movies. But again, I'm a sound guy, so I only shoot now for 
fun and uh, I, I get an awful lot out of it. And like I say, that's part of the reason for my huge amount of gas is that uh, there are just so many lenses out there that are adaptable to uh, current digital cinema. Well, let, let's let's just um, go go back to where we, we were sort of heading there. Then I sort of took took it slightly in a, in a, in a different place, and and that's uh, to do with using cinefilm with stills cameras, uh, because as of, at the top of the show we did talk talk about that that's a, a popular thing, especially with uh, cine still, which is. Uh, uh, Kodak film, I believe, 500T. Is it 500T? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, with, with 800. 800T. No, no, I think it's 500 and then it becomes 800 when it when uh, when you take the REM jet off. Yeah, Cinestill is, is 800T, um, but I think it's based on a Vision 3 500T base. Yeah, exactly. That's that, yeah. that, 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 that's it. So, uh, I mean, what, what are your, your thoughts? Uh, Bill, on using cine film and the various kinds of cine film that, that are out there for stills work? Well, well first of all, I, I have a question for you guys. I, of course, I did a lot of research on, on cine film and notice that it said that you buy the film that does not have remjet. Yes. So you don't have to remove it. How, how can that be? Because without without a remjet backing, because you, you know the reason why that's there, right? Uh, I think other than reducing elevation? Well, yeah, because what happens is when you've got film, now we're talking 35 millimeter movie film, it could be 16 too, uh, running through the camera, there's a pressure plate that's holding that film in the gate. Otherwise, it would be weaving and jumping all over the place. Now, that pressure plate is chrome, solid, beautiful, polished chrome, and it's very shiny. So if light were to, uh, photons are entering, entering the lens, going through the gate, striking the film, if there were no rim jet, There'd be a bounce off that plate, and that's where you get the halation. So with the black on it, it's perfect. So maybe with still cameras, it's not needed because there's not a pressure plate is what I'm well, thinking. Well, well, there is, but it's not chrome. It's right. They're black, yeah. They're yeah. black. Yeah. So maybe that's it, which that kind of surprised me. I went, wow, that's interesting. It, if, it, no, go on. No, I was just going to say, but if they're based on Kodak films, then uh, – I'm used to the old school uh, 50D, the 250D, and the 500T, yeah. and uh, they all have rimjet on them, of course, because they're they're meant for motion picture. But if you don't need it for still cameras, then what a great idea! Well, having shot both, and and Johnny, maybe you can jump in if I'm I'm wrong about any of the technicals on this, or this would be a great question for for Andre Dominguez, um, who works at Cinestill. But you know, having shot both of them, you can see the halation on Cinestill. Uh, is when there are point light sources, right? It, because it shows up as this bright red halation around those light sources. So if you are shooting it in bright sunlight, your photo is going to look, uh, it's going to look really weird. Whereas I like shooting it sort of at twilight and at night. Whereas with 500T, which has the remjet, uh, it doesn't have that halation, but then you have to remove the rem remjet, which is, right. you know, I, I, I've done it once and I never want to do it again. Mm. Um, so I don't know if Cinestill is doing something in addition to the remjet removal, um, but you certainly can see the outcome of it. No, the, they, they said you could just process it normal C41. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Just that's you do amazing. it straight C41. There's no remjet on it. Uh, they remove it for you, but they may do something else to it in addition to removing the remjet. Yeah, perhaps. Sure. But, but like I say, I've, I've shot black and white 35 millimeter film forever because it does not have remjet because it's, you know the gray backing so it works out good mm -hmm. and um the the only speeds available these days i think 52 22 is maybe 200 and 52 31 is 80 i use eastman 52 31 black and white negative film i rated it 125 processed it in hc 110 for eight minutes it looks oh, yeah. great mm -hmm. it just looks great and actually you can under process it over whatever you really you really can't mess it up and it's free. I've got thousands of feet. So you figure you only need three or four feet for a roll of film. Probably yeah. never going to shoot all that. Uh, but I would love to try to run some old, and I have, I think I told Simon in one of my emails that I have over 9,000 feet of Kodak color negative film in my film <laughs> freezer. By the way, I have a huge <laughs> freezer that it, all, all that's in there is like a couple of frozen tacos and a whole bunch of film. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like my fridge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm never, I'm never going to use all that. So a lot of times I'll give people a film so they can experiment with it. A lot of students, uh, I work with an experimental program at Duke university and a lot of the students there I've sold and or given them film. They've come up with some pretty, beautiful images now most people probably would not like that but heck heck they're experimental so you know anything goes and it looks really good but i have a feeling that if you're going to use motion picture film you kind of want to use modern because let's face it there's age fog that develops after years and the faster you know the higher the iso the more trouble you're going to have with age fog now yeah. if you're using a slow film like 50 I've got some 50 in there. It's probably 15, 20 years old. And I've actually shot that and I've forgotten which was the new stuff and which was the old stuff. It looks that good. Yeah. And, oh. uh, Wait, so can we, can we back up for one sec here? Sure. Uh, Cause we're talking about shooting cinefilm and getting that, that uh, cine look. Uh, can we discuss what that is? Um, because in my mind, and I think, I, I think a lot of people will have different conceptions of this. But when people talk about the cinematic look, there's obviously no single thing that defines the cinematic look. So when it comes to the lenses, people often think about, you know, flare and flaws and aberrations. To me, a crucial component of the cinematic look is low contrast, uh, certainly compared to the stills and digital stills that you see. And I'm wondering whether, well, A, wh what do you think the cine look is sort of typified by? And B, whether that low contrast is desirable be for anything beyond uh, making color grading easier. Yeah. Well, first of all, if I may add, are, are you talking about also about the, uh, the size of the, uh, the aperture? Like, are you shooting in, in uh, two, three, nine to one widescreen? Are you shooting one, one, eight, five, you know, regular movie screen that has a lot to do with the cinematic look <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. As Simon, said, one of my favorite cameras, still cameras, uh, as as Johnny will know, is my X Pan. Ah, yeah, love that. That's, that sound is exactly the reason why. Uh, Wait, I didn't I, know you owned. I didn't know you owned an X Pan. I I do I do own an X Pan, right, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so aspect ratio definitely part of it. Yeah. Yep. But also you're again, uh, the part of the cinematic look, and I agree with you is the lower contrast, although you could change all that if you want to, but I like things that are sharp, but they're not sharp. You know what I mean? They're soft, but they're not unsharp. Uh -huh. There's the, there's the word they're soft, but they're not unsharp. And then you've got super sharp lenses and you take the same model and, and shoot their face, you know, with either, you know, with digital, of course, the same lens and then switch it over to a uh, film there, there, there's definitely a, a difference there, but I, I think there's, there's so many combinations of, of things now to take into consideration about that look that anything goes. And I, I think a big part of it is again, is the lower contrast and also a lack of it's a, a, or an addition, additional beautiful softness mm -hmm. that maybe you can't get, get with a sharp lens. And uh, I push for that a lot, but there's sometimes you need to have that sharp image and that contrast. And I love that too, but the cinematic look, and also uh, I love flaring. I, I use the term milkiness. You look through this old uh, 14 millimeter, 14.5 ingenue, and it just has this milky look in black and white. You don't notice it as much, but uh, in color, it, it's really noticeable. And for some people that they don't like it, they just don't like it. And, you know, I'm squirming and I'm jumping all over the place. Oh, look how cool that is. And they're like, yeah, whatever. So I think a lot of it also has to do with personal preferences. Yeah. You know, that description that you just gave of uh, sharp but not sharp. Johnny and I were discussing a specific lens recently um, it, as part of my quest for lenses that will give me a more <laughs> cinematic look with Cinestill. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have just, here's the breaking news. I've just ordered that lens. Whoa. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I, I didn't tell you this, uh, no. but I just ordered a Leica 51.5 Sumerit. Yes. <laughs> which I think the reason I got it is because I saw a couple of shots with it using Cinestill and it delivers on that. You know, it's soft but sharp at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think any lens better is be any 
you know, still camera lens anyway. I don't think there's any lens that better delivers the, on that exact description than that lens. Yeah, the 1.5 is really rare, right? It's not that rare. There are a few variations of it, like the the Xenon or the Taylor Hobson variant that are extremely rare. But the, mm-hmm. the 1.5 on its own, I mean, it's rarer than other Leica lenses, right. but at least yeah. here in Hong Kong, it's pretty easy to find. Yeah, you can. You, they're out there. They're not impossible to find. It's just the condition can be yeah. difficult because all Leica lenses from the 50s, especially, they don't necessarily age really well. So it, I think condition is it's tough to find good ones. Yeah, it's true. More than yeah, is else. that an LTM mount or an M mount? Uh, the one I got was an LTM, but they do nice. come in. Nice. Oh, yeah, that's great. What, what are you going to use it on? What I camera? Am, uh, I'm going to use it on a Leica. One of okay. them. Uh, okay, but I, I oh okay, so we're talking about still camera, not video. Yeah, not video. So okay, no, I sorry I about that. Shoot. Yeah, because my mind immediately went to video because actually the, it's pretty easy to convert a 39 mil, millimeter uh, LTM to uh, an EF mount or a Micro Four Thirds especially. Uh, just pops right on there. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, it would look great in video. Um, that's not my world. I, as mentioned, you know, I've got right. my, my best friend and brother who do that. But it's the, the look and stills that I want. And have you tried this lens? No, I I have a, a whole stack of like lenses, but I don't have that one. I think I've got a Summicron or whatever. It's a one laying around here somewhere, and I use I use all of my uh, Leica lenses for black and white, so they all look good to me. Yeah, you know, I shoot at ISO one twenty five. It just looks freaking great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just it's unbelievable. I can't resist whenever I see a Leica lens. I don't care the the. the the one that I just picked up is all scratched. You know, I don't care. And, you know, I've got uh, friends in higher places. <laughs> so I can actually take that front optic off. And I know it would be changing the character of the lens, but I could actually send that in and have it recoded, mm. especially if it's not scratched deeply. And it comes back a brand new p- piece of glass. And then you put that back in. Now, yes, it does change the characteristics of the lens, but it's kind of a fun thing to do. I actually had a... Uh, you could probably tell the 18 millimeter is my favorite focal length, but I actually had an 18 millimeter Schneider lens made specifically for cinematography. And the, the it was all moldy on the front lens element. Thank God it was just the front end lens element. Well, $600 later, I got back a, a brand new element that had been reground and recoded. And then uh, my tech put, put it back in the lens. And again, just gorgeous, gorgeous image. So, uh, but sometimes I like them just rough. So. Oh. Now, have you guys, uh, Perry, I know what you just said, but have you guys done any video stuff at all or given it a try or just pretty much the DSLR type video stuff? I have tried uh, using a a few times. I've tried using my brother's uh, GH5 um, to us eating Carolina Reapers, but I wouldn't call that <laughs> fine, fine cinematography. <laughs> we, used, uh, we used contact CY lenses for that. Wow. No, well, you know, there's, I, I think Simon had mentioned that he wants to get into the types of cameras because I think that that means a lot too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I was just going to say, because you've, you've mentioned a few times uh, Red and Black Magic and, and uh, the, the digital cine cameras. And I think it's, it's you know, generally oh, speaking, yeah. we don't know a great deal about that kind of stuff at all. So anything that you're going to say about those, we're going to be learning, and I, I think. And I do, I do have a specific question. I might be jumping way ahead on this topic because I, I, this is admittedly um, an area that is not my expertise is, you know, digital cine cameras. Um but something that's very – and I don't know if maybe you can speak to this one, but something that's very interesting. So uh, uh, Lucas Frazee sent me an article from IndieWire earlier this week, and it was about the um, Alexa 65 cameras, <laughs> which uh, that's, I guess, apparently what they shot Joker on and some yeah. other films that are out recently. And so it's really – I mean, the article is very interesting, but it's there's this weird thing that I see going on um, where – I feel like the whole Boca fanaticism era that we're living through in still photography is sort of like now influencing 
cinematography and everybody shooting everything with that kind of bokeh close-up look. Um, and I, and I'm not sure I feel how I feel about that quite honestly, but it's interesting and it is going on right now. And I, um, and, and I wonder how that is, is maybe that is affecting how people are choosing lenses and the look that they're going for. And I guess that interplay between, you know, what's going on in still photography and cinematography. I, I feel like at least from my perspective i'm i'm way more influenced by cinematography as far as what i like the look that that i like to see in my own photos versus still photographers um so i i don't know if that's something that you see happening in terms of kind of lens choices and um how much of that interplay is happening between what people like to see in still photos and then what they want to do in cinematography yeah that that's a battle that i'm constantly fighting with especially when i work with with a team and i you know even though i'm now sound and i really should keep my mouth shut a lot of times i'll just say well why does everything have to be shot wide open why i mean it looks it looks good (laughs) exactly (laughs) but why i mean you know Holy crap! Look, look at Orson Welles and all these people did all these films back in the day. It was like unlimited depth of field, and uh-huh. I, I realize that. Yeah, I can understand why you might want to have, but I think it also has a lot to do with the less busy the background is, the more focused you are on the subject. So if you're up close to someone, yeah, I can understand a close up. You know, the very shallow depth of field where their eyelashes are in, and and maybe their their nose is out or something like that. I, I think I can understand that because then you can only look at one thing and one thing only where you've got this huge depth of field. You've got this great big scene. There's all kinds of things going on within the frame. But but that being said, I still think I try to tell people do at least I don't know if this rule still applies, but just try to do at least a couple stops over wide open. And I know that like I have two sets of Zeiss uh, 35, you know, lenses, two complete sets and wide open yeah they're they're pretty nice but man you get down to t4 yeah and yeah. oh my god and it's still the background is is out of focus but it's just not hugely out of focus to where you notice it and so i i i figure i, I know they used to say t8 and you're there how does that saying go but i yeah. didn't be there right <laughs> yeah and i say t4 and you're there because i think it, it's the best i try to shoot everything at four and I'll, but most of the people i work with these days they're wide open and yeah. for instance i've got this gorgeous uh 20 to 100 cook zoom lens from the 70s the same exact lens that we used in just about every movie you can imagine you know the shining and easy rider blah 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 um that lens is absolutely gorgeous. Wide open, yeah, it, it looks pretty. But uh, I still feel like when you just close it down one stop, the image just pops out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, another reason to own, you, you've got that cook look. Um, so it's, it's just very exciting, the things you can do. And again, this is not like still photography. You're right. With still photography, you only have to have an – an image that you're shooting and you, and you worry about that image with video or digital, it's a constant thing. So that's why lens zoom lenses and we can jump into this later, but that's why zoom lenses need to be par focal lenses. So they'll hold focus. And um, that's, that's, that's very important that, that sitting lenses are meant to shoot sitting. It needs to be sharp all the time. And so you could adjust the focus while you're shooting yeah. and, and stay up with that. And it's really hard to do with a, with a still lens, especially if it doesn't have focus gears. And also the focus throw is important. A lot of still lenses have a short throw and similar mm-hmm. lenses are long. And so it takes longer to get there, but it's more precise that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, you're speaking my language. I mean, the, the whole shooting wide open thing in digital, it, it looks cool, but you know, some of these vintage lenses in particular, you put them at 2.8, you put them at f4, and they just knock your socks off, you yeah. know? Yeah. You hear some people say, well, what's the point, though? You're buying a lens with this aperture. you got to shoot it wide open, and that drives me nuts. No, that's not the yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got plenty of, like, I've got super speeds, Zeiss super speeds for 16 millimeter, so they only cover a 16 millimeter camera. I can use those those speeds, though, on my black magic micro camera because it has a smaller uh, super 16 sensor in it and uh they're they are not sharp wide open they're just not i th- i think that's really it's, it's helpful that they're that wide they're t13s 
and it's helpful for focus in low light situations. But still, if you want to have a good image, you still have to use light. I think that's the problem with, with a lot of people these days. They figure they have a fast lens. What do they need light for? And come uh -huh. on, lighting yeah. is what it's all about. I don't yeah. care what you say. Lighting's yeah. more important than the lens in terms yeah. of it's just it is and i can't get that through people i i've had this conversation with like a couple of like <laughs> hardcore film people friends that i that i know um and like 1970s cinema <laughs> <sighs> like it's defined by this shitty look of nobody was using lighting anymore because they wanted that rough like man on the street look or whatever Right. And there are so many 70s films that look horrible. I mean, there are there are definitely exceptions, but there are so many films that look horrible because it's like they just threw lighting out the window and went and went for that kind of like we want that rough, gritty look or whatever, you know. Um, and it's a really and it's I guess this is where my thought was going with this new kind of place we're at right now, which is everybody wants like entire films shot as bokeh. It's like the seventies. It's the same thing. It was like, it looks so cliche now, you know, and it oh, really it, bothers it, me. <laughs> yeah. It, it bothers me too. Uh, again, <laughs> though, it's, it's, they're all artistic choices. Sure. And, and a lot of times when you're on a movie set, especially and the director and the DP are working together, they're not going to listen to you. You just keep your, mouth <laughs> right. you do your job, you know, and right. shut up. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, but you're right. I think there's a point where I particularly like, extreme depth of field and sharpness that's probably why i'm a wide angle kind of guy mm -hmm. uh, i've got every wide angle lens for 16 and 35 you can imagine starting at 3.5 and, and and gone from there um what yeah but that's for a 16 mil now i've got an eight millimeter fisheye and then i also just purchased a uh 10 millimeter 10.5 millimeter I want to say it's a, uh, I forget what it is now. <laughs> it may be a Zeiss. And it's it's just too wide for people. They look at it and go, ah, this is just too wide. And I'm on the other end going, God, look how beautiful that is. I actually worked on a <laughs> film years ago where the DP decided to use one lens. I That's probably cliched now. But he used one lens, 18 millimeter, and did not move the camera. So every shot... Wow. Yeah, the the images took, you know, the, the movie took place within it's kind of like watching theater. Absolutely loved it. We got the greatest angles using that 18 mil. And even up close, I know I realize it'll distort a face. Not true. It's gorgeous for a portrait lens. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh I I like that. And and everything was was super sharp, except when you were closer, of course. You know, obviously the closer you get your depth of field decreases. So, you know, uh, the stuff's going to be out of focus anyhow, which is I'm okay with. Yeah. So. Hey, I have well. a super newbie question for you. Uh, you know, when it comes to PL mount lenses, um, there are, there are a number of vintage lenses that you can get uh, as stills lenses, but also as uh, cinema lenses. So for example, the Zeiss 51.5 Sonar, Yes. Um, but the ones that are made in PL mount often have this weird double sort of elephant ear shaped uh, focus tab. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, those... that's way old school. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, a fo that's a focusing tab. And, and what that meant was a lot of times when you had that lens on a handheld camera, whether it be a 60 millimeter or a 35 millimeter Aeroflex, and you're holding that thing, you've got your right hand holding the camera and then with your right finger you, you could you could pull focus that way and and that's what they're there for they actually made some follow focus units that attached to those but they quickly went away when they came up with the idea of focus gears so basically that's not a gear but it's a focusing tab and that's basically all it's for is when you're hand holding a camera you can you don't have to look you can just look through the camera and and focus which is difficult by the way yeah uh, but that's that's what those are now. I don't know what lens though. See, actually, cinema lenses come in defined sets. Like Zeiss always came with, uh, I want to say sixteen, and then they had a twenty-four millimeter, and then they went to a thirty-two, and then they went to a fifty and a seventy-five. And other sets may have uh, a twenty five millimeter and a 35 millimeter and stuff like that. But I've never, they don't deviate much on um, 
designed because they're they're designed for film. So, but but definitely the sonars and the uh, distagons and the planars, all that stuff is available in cinema lenses when there's ice. And so that I, I feel comfortable knowing what the lens is. And actually, they say that the sonar lenses and Perry, this might be a question for you, but they say that the sonar lenses are a little softer. But man, yeah. my my eighty five sonar two point one is just sharp as a tack. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, I think that's consistent with the stills because the 50 millimeter sonars are softer wide open. And then when you stop them down, they, they start to pop and they get a lot sharper. But the 85 F2, uh, which I guess is optically the same as the T21, uh, is stunning, absolutely yeah. stunning wide open uh, and all the way through the ring. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it is definitely. And gor- gorgeous. As a matter of fact, I have you know, no surprise. I have three of those. Mm. And the early one is, is has different coding scheme where it's only maybe two coatings. And uh, I like that even better than the modern T star coatings on the, on the more modern lens it just has yeah. a look to it. That's different. I love it. I've um, got a, got a question on these, these uh, lenses, which just sound like they're, are we, are we talking about, modern lenses here now with when you with these so, somewhat yeah 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 um because going going back to i mean we talked about this when we had matthew duclos on that you know where we talked about the the differences between stills lenses and cine lenses and I, and I don't want to go too much into the detail now and if if people don't know um what that difference is it, it's well worth uh, going back to episode 52 to listen to matthew explaining the differences there so it's quite a big section, so I, I don't want us to uh, dwell too long on that. But one of the uh, the big differences is focus breathing, yes. and I'm just thinking now that if if you've got a lens that uh, is available as a stills lens and, and it's and it sounds as though it's the same lens as Cine, um, do we know if that lens focus breathes or whether because you can get Cine lenses, and we, and we, and again, going going back onto that that episode, we talked quite a bit about the <clears throat> uh, the Sam Yang stroke uh, Rokinon lenses, how they the the range of lenses that Sam Yang uh, produce are stills lenses with um, cine bodies, if you like, because they they they're not optical optical the opt optical mechanical design is still of that as a stills lens and not as a as a cine lens, and so. Um, so stills lens, you get the focus breathing. Cine lenses, you don't. And what's the story with these Zeiss lenses? Do we know? Well, actually, f- focus breathing uh, happens a lot. For instance, I'll go back to my – this will make a good example. I'll go back to my Cook Zoom. The reason that lens is so expensive is, is because it has internal focusing. So there's absolutely zero breathing. I mean, just none. And it's because it's an internal focus mechanism. On older ca- uh, lenses, say, for instance, I've got a Ingenue 25 to 250 zoom lens. That's the same lens they used on uh, Easy Rider. Matter of fact, I had a long talk with uh, DP Laszlo Kovacs back when he was alive, and he talked about using those lenses. But the front element actually goes in and out. So that's going to that's gonna cause your focus breathing because, you know, basically uh, – you know, as you focus in, it, it changes, it changes the field of view a little bit and it kind of comes in or out and it's kind of disturbing. So as now on a prime lens, you don't have that much of an issue. It, it, it depends on, you know, the focusing mechanism. Uh, it's a big time issue on zoom lenses and long lenses. I've got a Russian 135. That's just beautiful when I shoot it normal, but when we try to do a rack focus, it breathes so bad that you can't use it. And, and it's because of the, the focusing mechanism where the lenses are just going apart and coming close together again. So on uh, the new cooks and all, and all that stuff, I'm, they've corrected for all that stuff. And so you won't see focused breathing, maybe a little bit here and there, but nothing to get excited about. But let's face it, uh, still lenses were made to shoot for still photography and not, not for digital. So actually, uh, there's a lot of basic information you need to know. When you buy a zoom lens, for instance, uh, more than likely, if, if you're buying a lens that costs maybe three or 400 bucks, that's not going to be a parfocal lens. And what a parfocal lens does is that it maintains, uh, you know, focus throughout the entire range. So you could zoom in, focus on the, the subject, zoom back, and it'll be in focus. If it's a very focused lens, 
it, it doesn't work that way. If you zoom in and focus, then zoom back, more than likely it won't be. So you have to kind of focus through whatever setting you have it on. So that's why Zoom lenses, especially cine, cost, cinema, cost so much is because they've taken taken that into consideration. There's also a thing as uh, uh, ap uh, aperture uh, ramping where, say, you buy a, a Zoom lens that's a T or I'm sorry, an F4. And then when you get to the long end, it's like a whatever, a 5.6. Uh, you don't have that in cinema zooms. They're, they're straight through all the way. And uh, also zoom tracking, where if you center the lens and then you pull it back, the center should still be there on the wide as it is anywhere in the range. And on a very focal lens, that may change because they weren't meant to do that. And so it could shift. Your center could be a, you know, a foot the other left or right. So all these things are, are taken into account when they build a high quality zoom lens. And again, on prime lenses, that's why they're much easier to be adapted to cinema because you, you still have breathing and, and little problems, but you don't have, uh, you know, the stuff that zoom lenses, the problems that zoom lenses could, could exhibit. Can I, so I can I ask you about, Oh, sorry. No, I just didn't know if I answered that question. <laughs> Yeah, no. I, I, well, I, I, I think my question was actually you answered a lot of questions there. The, although the part of the uh, I was talking more specifically to do with the, those those Zeiss lenses in particular, but I, I, I think that was probably we, we don't know the, the exact answer on that one. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Which Zeiss lenses again? It was the ones that the, the Perry was talking about. Ah, um, oh, like but, the eighty-five f two sonar. Yeah, and there's a two. When you mentioned that there's a two point one, a two a T two point one version of it. So it sounds as if like it is the same lens, but just converted for for silly use. Yeah, I don't I don't know about that, but the good way to test it is put it on a camera and shoot it. <laughs> on that note, I want um, can I ask you about uh, two specific lens mounts and one specific lens? Sure. Uh, so we've mentioned a few times on the podcast but none of us have any in-depth knowledge about why. Um, CY lenses and Leica R lenses are seem particularly popular for conversion to, to cinema. Um, and I'm wondering if, A, that's true, and B, you know why? Well, the most popular mount out there now, now the PL mount is definitely high-end, top-of-the-line, very expensive, and a lot of people can't afford to buy a PL set of lenses. But you can buy a lens that can be converted to or originally as in a Canon EF mount. Canon EF is the most popular flat out out there. And just about every single lens in the still world and every place else can be converted to an EF mount. In particular, the CYs. And because I actually bought a whole set of the, uh, uh, what the heck, Yashica uh, ML line. Yeah. The, the ML lenses, those things are. Those things are beautiful. Those convert very quickly uh, via a $20 adapter to EF. And since they're made for 35 mil, they cover everything. Uh -huh. And uh, that, that's, that's what I always look for. Now, most of the time when you find a lens, you know it's going to cover the frame because it was meant to cover a, a 24 by 36 millimeter you know, still frame. So basically, uh, actually, I've projected lenses, uh, a lens projector. Actually, you could put a lens on a projector and it forces, I don't know how many megawatts of light through it. And it projects a focus screen on the wall. And you can really see the defects in a lens that way. And when we put one of those on the projector, it actually covered to the Airy 65. Just some of the lenses covered that much of a sensor. They were, they were unbelievable. And um, so, you know, that being said, yeah, the, the, it's the, if you are shooting with Canon, that's why I highly recommend if you buy a digital camera, make sure it has a Canon EF mount. Don't, don't get anything else because it's, it's going to be expensive and or a little bit more difficult to get lenses for it. EFs, my God, every single Ny Nikon lens that I own, every Pentax, every single everything fits an EF mount via the proper adapter. You're you're saying some of those lenses that you've converted to EF will will cover an Alexa sixty five sensor. I, I swear to God, I've had a couple lenses. Now I don't know if they were the the CYs, but I brought a bunch of lenses in one day just to uh, 
they sometimes they give me the projection room because it's pretty neat. I mean, that's a damn expensive projector. It's a, you know, it's a whole collimation system in there. But I love projecting lenses because if you project a lens that you think is crappy and it looks kind of good, it really is good because through the projector, it's showing right. everything. That's, that's like not the flashlight show up. crack. Yeah. Only only 50,000 times more. So it's going to look good. Now, if you get a, a piece of crap lens and you look at it on the projector and it's really gloomy, the edges are, or the corners are dark and it's not in focus. Yeah, you're dead. But most of the time you, you put and then also it'll show you what the coverage is. So does it cover 16? Does it cover 35? Does it go uh, super 35? Does it go full frame? And some lenses do and some lenses don't. It, it really depends on the exit pupil, you know, the, the rear lens element. That has a uh-huh. lot to do with it. And longer lenses generally are easier to cover than shorter lenses oh, yeah. because the lens is a lot closer to the film plane to where the long lens you can, it'll cover. Uh, but yeah, I've actually had some success on that that just surprised me uh, how much it covered. It was very exciting uh-huh. to, to realize that. So, uh, but, but you need a projector really to test that stuff. That that's the hard part. You, you mentioned you mentioned earlier, um, just just keeping on the subject of uh, the Canon EF mount. Um, I'm sure you mentioned about LTM lenses going going onto that, and the, the where that sort of uh, you know uh, uh, where that stuck in my head was uh, was that absolutely doesn't work with stills. With if you were to use a a Canon DSLR, you cannot. Yeah, you know, use. I may have mis- I may have misspoke on that. I'm looking ah. through. No, actually. Well, shoot. the thing is, it's going to be down to the, the how far away ultimately the mount is away from the sensor. So if if you yes. can, so if if that's ne- if that isn't necessarily the same as it is on a on a Canon EOS camera when it goes onto some form of um, cine camera, then yeah, it, do, it that rule goes out the window. Then I guess. Yeah, I, well, actually, I think I misspoke, and, and what I meant to say was an LTM is easily converted uh, to a micro four thirds. Right, yeah, and, and it just pops right on there, and yeah. and uh, it, it looks good. And also, uh, now that they have larger six uh, K sensors available in the Blackmagic cameras that still have the micro four thirds mount, you could actually then use those lenses. Now, does it cover? I don't know. I've never had a chance to test that. Um, but yeah, the thread mount, the LTMs are, are the most difficult, I think, out of all the mounts to transfer and the M42 being the, the easiest yeah. and Nikon is also very easy. Well, that was, that was the other thing, of course, for when we've just been uh, going back to Perry's question there about the popularity of CY lenses and uh, Leica R lenses. Um, I think some some of that possibly goes back to the the, the show with Matthew Duclos was uh, he mentioned uh, CY lenses being very very popular. I can't remember him mentioning uh, Leica R, but the the other part of that was when you you were saying there about um, how easy some lenses are to adapt to uh, Canon EF uh, Canon EOS mount. It's a case of well, both of those literally are very simple to adapt to it, whereas. There are plenty of lenses out there that simply are very, very difficult to adapt. You know, so sort of like the Minolta's and uh, yes. um, Canon FD lenses and so on. So oh. they, they aren't going to get used. Another another thing about why, and you can confirm this to me now, but I'm I'm of the opinion, um, apart from the fact that you know, Nikon lenses and Pentax lenses focus the wrong way, in my opinion, uh, but in terms yes, of the do. direction <laughs> of travel, um, in the in the cine world, is that is that even more of a rule uh, that generally? Because when, I mean, I'm looking at the picture of uh, an Ari camera right now, and it, uh, it's got an 80 it, millimeter lens on it, and that focuses in the in the direction which I would call the correct way. Is that is that the the, the normal way to focus cine lenses? Yes, yes, it is. There's, there's all city lenses focus the same direction, as far as I know, and uh, but it's not a problem if we we're using an adaptive uh, Nikon lens that goes the other direction. A lot of times, the focus puller they've just done it enough. They they understand that they have to go the other direction. But there is a special uh, follow focus that has a reverse gear on it, and you put that little gear in, and it, and it does it for you. And so you're oh, still okay. using your muscle memory for follow focus, but it's, it's taking care of that for you. But yes. Generally the correct way is most lenses. I don't think I have any lens that doesn't focus a true cine lens that doesn't focus. Uh, they all focus the same direction. 
I, I think I want one of those devices that will focus my Nikon lenses in the right direction. Then. Yeah, and it's it's not expensive <laughs> oh, my either. Stills I mean, camera. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's amazing. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm on the Duclose site right now. They must think I'm stalking them because I'm on it every day. But uh, yeah, you can get they'll they'll do a high end conversion, uh, which is a mechanical conversion. Uh, for a contact CY, it's one hundred and fifty nine dollars. Now that may seem like a lot of money, doesn't to me, considering what you're getting for it. And same for Leica R, and then Nikon, they're they're pretty cheap. Uh, to EF is one twenty five, and those are hard conversions. Those aren't adapters. They actually yeah. do it for you. And then you know another crazy thing about cinema is that, and what I love about still lenses, you don't really need a whole lot. A lens hood, some filters, you know, you're out the door. When you're shooting with uh, digital cameras and cine lenses, again, you need follow focus, you need matte boxes, you need filters for that matte box, uh, you need r rods and support to hold that heavy lens. Uh, there's just so many oh donuts that go behind the matte box so that light won't come in, mats for the front of the matte box. It's just endless. And, uh, and you can see why I switched over to sound. I have much less gear to carry around but with yeah nowadays i just pull up in my i had a fiat and i would just pull up and disappear between all those trucks and that's all you need for sound but man you have to have a lot of you know truck space for cinema because you've got a lot of stuff that goes with it boxes of filters and a lot of people say well can't you just do the filtration in post well yeah you can but, but why i mean i i'd rather have that look um you know try to keep yeah. it as original as possible but i've got 400 filters for these lenses <laughs> so i figure if i could sew each one i could just retire just sell each uh, one for 50 bucks i mean come on uh, i have everything and how many times you use those a year i don't know once or twice but you got to have them if the db says hey do you have a diffuser number two you better have it you know because otherwise you'd be in trouble but but again that's what makes it all fun for me is is trying to match up get all the accessories for it and i'm always scrounging through boxes and finding all these gems uh original lens caps that say yashica on them and stuff like that i buy those up in a second cuz i figure someday down the line i'm going to be picking up another lens that's going to need a yashica lens cap and there you go so i i think i'm a i'm addicted you sound like you'd be one of my best customers at Central Camera Company. Oh, I'm, I'm going to come see you. <laughs> well, we we have a little camera shop here in town. They asked me not. Great. They really don't want me to put their name out <laughs> because <laughs> I told them. I said, "Well, you know, Classic Lens Podcast. A lot of people listen to this." Um, but he's my. Every time I go in there, he'll immediately say, "Look what I got for you," and I, he knows I'm dead. Wow. <laughs> he he knows I'm dead. <laughs> and, and and there it is it's this gorgeous uh like a lens i actually picked up a 90 millimeter i can't even remember the name and it was gorgeous for 30 dollars. and it was an L ltm couldn't wait to try it shot some film processed it realized someone had taken out one of the center elements oh yeah so what a waste this beautiful lens in the original case uh for 30 dollars and I even had a 90 millimeter uh, viewfinder for my Voigtlander. And uh, it's one of those things where, well, it always doesn't work out. But, but a lot of times it does. And I love scrounging through a good old-fashioned camera store. I'm sure Chicago has a lot more. No, we don't. No? <laughs> no, there's exactly one left. <laughs> really? Yeah, they're all, they're all gone. They're all gone. Yeah, Gosh. Joe, yeah we, Joe, we've got a big one in Columbus, Ohio that I deal a lot with. Uh, Johnny, I've just got a, a question for you there. Um, do you have people that walk into the shop and then you immediately walk straight over to the object that you know they want to buy before they've even got to you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not that good. <laughs> oh, you mean you mean I know what they want to buy or they know what they want to buy? Well, they, they might not know what they want, but you know what they want. And uh, yeah, by the, by the time they've walked over to your desk where you're standing, you've got it there waiting for them. So thinking, <laughs> oh, this this is gonna this is this is a Robbie J lens. This is or well, or, or, that, yeah, there are a few or, there are, yeah there are a few people like that. And they work they walk in. I'm like, oh, guess what we just got? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You guys are. <laughs> there are people in in um, well, number one, it sounds like your your uh, Johnny Mike Ekman's victim on the other end of that. Oh, Mike Eckman totally set me up. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> he knows he, what you want. 
Oh yeah, he totally he totally set me up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, I I already have the money back from that. Uh, oh nice that foul, purchase that went foul. So, but yeah, that was that was a good one. The Mike but, one. Simon, the thing you're asking about is totally real because um, there are so many vintage camera and lens shops here in Hong Kong. Uh, and there's a few that I frequent. And there's one in particular, the place, Johnny, where I got your Roly camera from. Oh, yeah. Every time I walk into that shop, the guys go, <laughs> oh, it's you. Check this out. Yeah. And the time I went in, they were like, oh, it's you. Check this out. And they they brought out a top core 52.8 Heliar. And I was like, dude, you know how hard these are to find? I have three, and it took me so long to find them. <laughs> Do you want a fourth one? <laughs> well, that, that's the mark of a good salesman, though. Let's face it, that is a business. And so yep. if you know, oh, your, yeah. you know your customers, right, Johnny? I mean, you just, that's what I'd be doing. I'd be targeting yeah, them. Oh, sure. Yeah. There are people that, you know, they know, I know they like certain things. So they ask me, so what's new? And I'm like, for you? Well, there's, let's go look at this. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, that does happen for sure. It's actually, it's one of the most fun parts of doing that is, having like good customers and you know what they're into. Yeah. Cause you know, they're total, they're just, they're like this, they're total. Wait, wait, Perry, what's the word we're supposed to use? Enabler. No, 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 no. The Japanese word, the uh, anime junkie people. Oh, otaku. Yeah. Thank you. The otakus, the otaku people. <laughs> <laughs> now well, I appreciate um, it when I go into a shop and, I'm, I know they have something waiting for me. They're also going to give me a good deal. That's another thing. A lot of the, the one sales guy I work with, I'm on a different pricing schedule because I'm in there buying all the time. So they'll have a lens marked at 129. I'm going to get right. it for 30 because you yeah. got to figure they only paid 15 for it. They're doubling their profit and right. they're making a, a, a lifetime customer happy. And, and that's, that's what it's all about. And I love oh, that yeah. part. Yeah, that's, that's totally cool. Yeah. So. You know, the, the thing you were talking about uh, just a few minutes ago, Bill, about all the things that you got to have uh, when you are shooting, uh, wait, when you're filming, it, it always blows my mind, the process of doing cinematography, because when I watch them doing what they do, once you add that element of time, like it just, it, it boggles my mind that they're able to come, that you, you guys are able to compose, you know, where in a way where every frame is well thought out and smoothly transitioned because, you know, I, I struggle enough with stills and, and there's no time element there. Uh, and I, I mean, this is taking the conversation in a totally different direction, but oh, I'm no, just I so like curious. this. It's good. I'm just so curious to get some insight into how you think about the element of time when it comes to composition. Mm. Well, here's, here's the thing. It's, mm. it, it all depends if you got a if you have a good DP that that's where it all starts and the DP is going to have a good team with him, him or her it's going to be you know first assistant camera which I've done you know many millions of times and second assistant and even third assistant somebody that's going to slate and that kind of stuff but they all work together but the DP basically already has the vision because that's all been pre-discussed with the director you know in future or in past meetings uh, but you're right you know actually I've been on shoots where we've shot maybe eight pages a day, which is insane amount of work. And I, I believe feature films move at a slower pace, like maybe two to three pages a day. But anyhow, uh, you're right. There's a certain time constraint you're working against, but also you have to remain cool and calm under that circumstance. And when the shot comes up, the second assistant or first assistant that has to pull focus better damn well had practiced that move because you've only got four or five takes, maybe not even that much. And then, you know, you're moving on. And uh, so you're right. It, it is a, a daunting task when it's cinema, but it helps since film is a collaborative e effort. Uh, it, it helps a lot to have a good team. And if you all work good together, yeah, it's actually pretty, pretty easy to get that shot. Right. But so, I mean, th that in itself is insane that the whole thing is, you know, so uh, it, it's choreographed down to the focus movements. Um, yeah. Yeah, but when totally. I, but when I what I meant by the element of time is oh you know when it comes to still photography there nothing moves right ah, yeah and and then when you're when you're filming the key difference is the image is moving yes and I can't even begin to wrap my head around how you approach composition uh, <laughs> when, totally when it, you know, a two hour long image rather than a frozen one 
Yeah. Well, yeah. I, again, it's just the, the, the DP will call the lens and, you know, it's either going to be a 14 millimeter wide shot or, or a 135, you know, really close up. But uh-huh. the, the other important thing, you're right. The frame, and that's why it's so important that these lenses are as precise as they are. The frame is constantly in motion. You're following, you've got a person that uh, has an electronic, now they're all wireless uh, digital follow focus units. But we got a person that had marked where the actor is going to step and they, they know ahead of time when to pull that focus. And if you mess up, you, you know, you got to do it again or you have to cut out of that scene at that point because it'll be out of focus. But it is a lot more complicated. And that's why I like still photography because it's so damn relaxing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at least to me, <laughs> it totally is. Admit. So, yeah. P- Perry, I, if you haven't seen it yet, talking about the element of time and composition, um, you need to go tonight, today or whenever. You need to watch the film Victoria if you haven't seen it. Um, Victoria came out in 2015 and it's, it's a one take film. The mm-hmm. entire film is shot in one take. Um, like which Birdman. It, like, yeah, like Birdman. Um, and it's, it'll blow your friggin' mind, Barry, How? because it's what? How? <laughs> it, well, it's people have done it before. I mean, there are a number of film and I mean, you know, you, um, there are a number of filmmakers who famously shot a lot of very, very long takes. Alfred um, Hitchcock, the rope. Yeah, exactly. Hitchcock. I mean, you know, rope. Oh my God. I God. mean, that film, it like it leaves you, you can't even breathe watching rope. Yeah. And that's um, only 10 minutes per roll of film. So they yeah, yeah. cleverly cleverly yeah. did those little trans- yeah. transitions. But but the, but Victoria, I mean, you should you should I, I've seen it several times and it just like it really blows me away because the amount of planning that is needed to do it, just the amount of planning to successfully pull it off. But then to actually have a film that's like beautifully shot, right? It's like you figured just like making the cut of being able to do it one take is one thing, but then to actually make a film that's really great and is full of like these beautiful portraity compositions and stuff. It, to me, it still, it still blows my mind every time I see that film. So it's, you know, even ones with loads of cuts. I, I can't believe that people are able to do this, but <laughs> yeah. I remember the first time I watched Planet Earth. Um, and I, I, I remember pausing it many, many times. Um, and every single time I paused it, I was just like, this would be an incredible still image. And there's, yeah. you know, an hour nonstop of this. And I just, it, it's amazing. So right. does that, Bill, does that stuff tend to be, storyboarded in advance um in terms of the framing the camera position the lens uh even even the lighting and then you know you've got basically thousands of moving parts just to film one scene well yeah i'm sure on a larger budget heck yeah they have storyboards uh you know that everything is pre-planned on a lower budget film like the ones i work on are usually maybe 150 grand and below so there's really no money in the budget for a, a storyboard artist uh, I, I really think that you are working a lot of times when you get to that set, you're creating, I mean, you know what you want on that set, but you're still creating that look as you go. Uh-huh. So the DP, that's, that's their job. They're, they're looking at angles, you know, everybody else is setting up lights, you know, and I'm, I'm dinking around with microphones and everybody's doing their thing, but the DP and the director possibly are, are planning those, you know, what to do. And so, uh, yeah, with, but but sometimes we do have crude storyboards and, and we kind of know what we want. And another thing, it's called coverage. When you're when you're shooting, uh, most of the time when you're on a film, you'll shoot a master shot. So it'll be the whole thing through on a wide lens. That's like a master shot. You can always go back to that. But then you're going to drop into coverage. So you're going to be doing medium shots. You're going to be doing OTSs, which is over the shoulder. If you have two mm-hmm. actors, you know, you got to go over both shoulders. You might be doing close-ups, like they pick up a cup of coffee. And all of this stuff is shot. And then in editing, the editor has more options when you have more coverage. And so that's another way they do it. Now, on the long takes, I, I don't know. I-, I was blown away by Birdman. I just think it was just freaking fantastic movie. And you can't mess up unless they're fixing it somewhere. I don't know um, to shoot all the way through like that. It's just amazing. And the camera moves and the steady cam operators and all these people. That, that's another thing we really didn't talk about is the moving camera. How difficult another additional difficulty you have to deal with, whether it be on a dolly or a steady cam, uh, 
most of the time these days, that camera's always on the move. There's so, very, very few lockdowns. So for something a bit more specific, um, let, let's say, you know, there's those famous scenes in Bohemian Rhapsody where you've got the flare uh, uh, against yeah. a, a, a backlit, you know, singing scene, right? Yeah. Would Would that be... Are you able to choreograph that or do you just pick a lens that you know is going to do something and shoot the scene and see what it looks like? Yeah, I think it's a little of both. But, yeah, it's got to be pre-planned it, as it's not. I, I've always heard or no, I've always known that every single frame of a movie is not an accident. <laughs> it's pre-planned. Every once in a while, you'll get lucky and get something. But if your whole movie is a bunch of accidents, I'm not really sure how good that's going to look. Uh -huh. uh, but but pretty much everything is pre-planned. But there are certain lenses and focal lengths that will cause more of that that flare than others. And I, I you know what I think did did they shoot that? That wasn't film, was it? But I, I know it's got some vintage or you know lenses in it that they used. I'm pretty sure. And you I mean, the, it definitely looks like vintage lenses. I'm yeah. not sure. Which I'm again, it's not it. unusual these days. Oh, it's, it says, I'm just looking it up right now, and it was shot on Ari Alexa 35 with uh, Cook Speed Pancros for the first act and Hasselblad Prime DNA uh, nice. lenses. Later. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that would, have, that would have to be a special. And, you know, we didn't even get to talk about that, but I've got Hasselblad lenses that I could easily convert to PL mount nowadays. <laughs> and also to... Uh, EF mount is very easy. So you could have a whole set of Hasselblad lenses on your Blackmagic EF mount camera, which is fun. But again, so, might be too much for most people to deal how, with. How would you choose between like a Cook Kinetal or a, a Dalmeyer Super 6? Uh, well, a, a Kinetal was, uh, is just an older version, right, of uh, – lenses and then then they went to the pancros i'm not familiar with that other lens what is it maybe it'll it'll remind oh, the, uh, the uh like a dalmeyer super six anastigmat okay i'm trying to think because i've got two dalmeyers in my collection somewhere <laughs> oh. yeah oh they're neat and they're just well, the heads too they're just the optical uh, cells simon's used one of those um and they're super popular among oh, collectors here in god the yeah simon i wish i could show you the one i have i think it's a I forget the focal length. It might be a 90, but it's so in, it's in a uh, IMO mount. It's another thing you probably don't know what that is, but IMO was, was a special mount for 35 millimeter uh, Bell and Howe cameras back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So the, a lot of those wind up cameras that you see all that footage from world war two and all that junk, those were all IMO mounts. So they had a whole series of lenses and unfortunately you can't convert IMO to anything, but you could take the optical cell out and put it in a new body. And uh, that's what I'd like to do with the two Damars that I have. I, I've got a, and this thing is tiny. I've got a 25 mil right here. Super rare. And it is so small. I mean, you could practically swallow it, but it's the actual uh, lens elements in a group with, with the, uh, with the aperture inside of it. Yeah. Is that C-mount? Uh, no, it's actually came out of a, uh, a camera that was probably I can't remember which mount I got it out of now, but it was on a camera that was from the from the forties. I don't even know what the mount was, but I immediately recognized what it was. Found it at a yard sale, which is really hard to believe. Oh man! <laughs> and inside that lens case, and I, you know I could take that stuff apart. Is this perfect twenty five millimeter lens cell? And uh, but the problem is it's be like three thousand dollars to have that put into a, a you know a, a CNC body, but you could have it designed. A lot of these companies these days will actually design a lens body around your uh, optic cell. Yeah, if you if, are, <laughs> if you got a lot of money, there are more and more places in Hong Kong that are doing just that. Oh yeah, uh, and, I, I look them up all the time. Oh man, I mean I wish I could do that. If I could do that. Uh, I'd need another lifetime though to, to do all my lenses. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'd get it done, but again, you know, we didn't even really get to talk about, there's so many things involved in, in cinema lenses that uh, you could, we could go on for hours and hours, but I, I probably should. It, it, well, shut it, up. It, it, well, don't know about that, but it, it's, it, it's certainly a different world. And, and I, ju I just remember the, uh, going way back now, there, there was a, a question and we we got diverted actually and and it was to do with the um the look of a lens 
and you can get a, a distinctive looking lens. And I think we were talking, oh, I can't remember the make of the lens though. It was a T T two lens um, that you that you got, and it was a new new in the new in a box and things like that. A spirit was it a Spiritone lens? That they've got. Oh actually. yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and. And uh, I then went on about, you know, how do you deal with the look of one lens going from one scene to another yes. and keeping consistency? And that's when we went on to, like, groups of lenses and things. But how do you deal with that? Because, say, that lens that you talked about there, um, that's going to have a very sp specific look about it. Um, would you only use a lens that has a really specific signature and keep lens used to a minimum as in like you'd try and shoot as much as possible with that lens um because it might jar between scenes i'm, I'm yes. just, just thinking so i guess I'm, I'm i think i'm trying to answer the, my own question there but if if you wanted to use a specific lens for a scene would that actually could could that potentially uh control the look of the entire film because you want to use a particular lens in a certain scene well, actually, a lot of times my lenses are used as establishing shot lenses. So, for instance, the last couple of horror films that I worked on, you've got this house and it's dark and the lights, you know, it was a it was a Halloween movie. And so all the colored lights and all that stuff. And they were kind of flare. It was a beautiful shot with that lens. But that was an establishing shot. Then we went in and did the scene. So basically, a lot of my lenses are used just for that. For instance, I've got a 12 millimeter Zeiss that has a special look to it. Kind of, you know, the edges aren't super sharp. But when you close it down to, say, T5.6, it gets really sharp. It has its own signature wide angle, kind of an organic curvy look to it, which I really like. But I would not they would not use that then within the scene. I mean, unless there was a reason to do that. But again, a lot of times we'll use the weird stuff. Or you can use, as long as you use the same series of lenses within the shot so it doesn't become a jarring, you know, n n notice. And a lot of that stuff can now be corrected in post, but I'd still rather them keep to a, a certain uh, system. And, and so that's what I like. I know that I've got a certain set of cooks. I know I have a certain set of Zeiss lenses. I've got Ingenue, sets of Ingenues. I've got Schneiders. I didn't even mention the, the German lens Schneider. I've got a whole set of Schneider lenses. And they, they have a real low contrast look. So if I were to mix a, a Schneider, you know, 20 and then put in a Zeiss, whatever, 85, <laughs> there'd be a jarring difference. Hmm, that's it. I, I said, and that, that's just... Uh, reminded me of a conversation that Perry was having with Johnny about certain. Uh, I mean, I think we're talking about that low contrast look, and uh, Johnny yeah. mentioned the, uh, I think the thirty-five millimeter Curtagon, I think it was uh, to, to to Perry, and it's just interesting that you just said a, said a, a similar kind of thing there, with you saying like yeah, being being low low contrast. Yeah, I, I mean, it, you don't want that all the time. But again, that's just one of the benefits of an old lens. Some people might not think of it as a benefit. But but I think it is because it's harder to achieve that image in post, I think. Or do you have to filter up the lens? I still don't think you get the same look as you do using a classic for that specific situation. So since we have you here, uh, Bill, um, there's one of our favorite topics here on the on the podcast that has come up a number of times that maybe we can um work through a little bit and that would be talking about uh angle of view and field of view um and i guess maybe a little bit in a depth of field as well but i i know that you have definitely have some insights on this that you would like to Yes, and it's very th – those uh, terms that you just said are very, very important to a cinematographer. I mean, they're important to everybody, but especially to uh, cinema. Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah, we're here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I'll keep going. Waiting, yeah, waiting with anticipation. All right. So, I, I, although I was going to say uh, when 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 uh, Johnny just mentioned there about favorite subjects, I'm thinking favorite, not favorite. <laughs> after after the discussions we've had on the subject, but uh, please go on there, Bill. Okay. Well, you know, again, this is my interpretation, but the field of view, which by the way is my favorite thing, is it's simply uh, what your lens and camera to, together uh, can capture you know, from left to right, top to bottom, that that's the field of view. You, you look through the camera, it might be different on another camera 
to where an angle of view is what the lens is capable of seeing in degrees. And those degrees are set by, you know, the manufacturer. So it's a 50 millimeter. But sometimes when you put a 50 millimeter on, say, my red one that has a crop factor of maybe 1.4, uh, the field of view is a little bit different. So I concentrate on the field of view. I look through the camera. I see exactly what's going to record or film. And I'm very happy with that image. Uh, you know, I'm not really holding the manufacturer's feet to the fire when it comes to millimeters. You know, like this is supposed to be a, a 40 and it feels like a 42. I don't really care about stuff like that. Um, I just like what I see through the viewfinder. And, that, and that's basically what, in my interpretation, of what field of view is, is your view through the camera. And, uh, and so it's not mathematically calculated like millimeters, possibly in the angle of view, because you could get an angle of view chart for any lens. I've got tons and tons of Nikon and Canon brochures that show the different angles, right? So they got this wide angle of a farmhouse at like whatever. And then when they get into the 500 mil, it's a, it's a little old lady sewing or something like that. You know, that, that's the angle of view that, that lens, those lenses are capable of, of getting. It may change a little bit, though, inside your, your camera. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty simplified. I can't really think of a, a better description. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, cinematographers tend not to care about, um, for example, a full-frame reference, which digital photographers will use, because you know, even, even 35, Super 35 is a totally different format from 35-millimeter film. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, you're right. I think the full frame thing doesn't matter as much. I mean, let's face it, most of the cameras I work with have the super 35 frame anyways. Mm -hmm. And we can't afford an Alexa 65, which is really just two sensors kind of like hooked together, I guess. But it's it's pretty big. I uh, mean, I think the, the key thing here though, uh Simon, right? Is and Bill, is if you take, for example, a uh nine millimeter lens and you put it on a micro four thirds camera uh, and you use a lens with a much longer focal length to get, say, the same field of view on a, a larger sensor. Right. It's pretty much the same. Right. It, uh, yes. Oh. Wait, say say that again, because. So, yeah. What, what's going to happen is if. First of all, are you talking about that that nine millimeter? A nine millimeter lens will probably not cover micro four thirds. But if we're if we're not worried about that detail, you're just going from from nine. Uh, if you're in the same spot, right? If you don't yep. change the perspective, like it's a lockdown. Yeah, uh, allegedly you're seeing the same thing, right? Only one's blown up and one's wider. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's. That's that's all I wanted to hear, Simon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I remember all your arguments about this, which, by the way, I wasn't going to touch on because I, I'm afraid to do that. But <laughs> I, I mean, perspective we is come out numbered. Yeah, no, but is it perspective? Is is what you see from from your perspective? If you don't move and you just change the lens, it doesn't change the perspective. It just changes the angle of view. Yep. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> <laughs> but but again, I, I don't want people to be worried about crop factors and all this other junk. Put the lens on the on the camera and start experimenting and, and see what it can do. And that, that's what I recommend to all my students and, and all this other stuff. And let's face it, not every lens is going to work on every camera, but there's there's a lot of combinations out there you could dig up, probably come up with some some nice images. So just just I'm I'm really not going to dive dive into this one. Um, I, I've I've done it done it to death and been wrong every time. Um, <laughs> but what would be? I mean, I see some things when you, when you see some um, articles there, such as like Dunkirk. There was there were some articles about why Dunkirk was shot on seventy mil for IMAX, right? And and they were shown in in normal cinemas, but if you went to see it in IMAX, you could actually see more of the picture. And the, um, I think they could anyway. I'm not sure if they squashed it or or you could see more of it. Um, I believe you could see more of it when you saw it on IMAX. Um, so it's it's about 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of digging myself a hole again, or I feel like digging myself a hole. And, and actually, we're talking about war films now, and I suppose we're going to trenches now. And I, I, I love going into trenches. It seems. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's what, what from a cinematographer's point of view? Why would you want to shoot in seventy mil as opposed to shooting in one of the smaller formats? Well, I would guess one is the aspect ratio. That's probably a pretty wide. You see, I think that. Uh, when you shoot it in 70 millimeter, actually it's uh, 65 millimeter film. If you're talking about film now, yeah, yeah. It's, it's 65 going through the camera. The re that other five millimeters is for the print. So they put the soundtrack on it. Yeah. Uh, however they do it these days. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I, I have a feeling though, that the aspect ratio should still be the same, whether it's shot. I mean, a lot of times you could shoot 35 and blow it up to 70. I mean, you could do that. I don't know why it'd be a lot cheaper, I think, than using 70 millimeter film. But the actual the reason why you would do it, I would think, would be the aspect ratio. You've got that wide, all encompassing view and lots of action and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I've only seen actually the only 70 millimeter I've seen were actually film prints. And maybe one of them was a blow up. So it really wasn't that good. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, speaking as someone who saw Dunkirk five freaking times in seventy millimeter on the screen <laughs> at the Music Box Theater in Chicago, it was it's it was an incredibly like immersive experience. And part of that, I mean, is the sound. I mean, you'll appreciate this too. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I think he gets a lot of criticism for how loud the sound was in that film. Um, but if you're sitting in a theater watching a 70 millimeter, I mean, hearing a Stuka come down, you can understand why they were terrifying and why they were literally, you know, the sound of those planes were literally weapons of war, the sound itself, because they yeah. were absolutely terrifying. And so that film in 70 millimeters, like captures something I don't think you could have done any other way. If you think about the final projection of it onto yeah. a screen showing it in 70 millimeter, you know what I mean? It's like, you got to kind of think about the end. Think with the end in mind about what it's going to look like right, actually now, let, let in a theater. Let, yeah. Let me, let me stop you there because this, now you are sort of back onto my territory now and why yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing something different with large formats over a smaller format. Sure. And the, the point being here is if, if um, by, I mean, we're talking about aspect ratios, which actually might actually be where 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 I'm actually coming from, and I just don't know because I've really been struggling to explain why I've got a, an issue with this subject. And in theory, if um, for for whatever reason, if you shoot on seventy mil and then you project it in a in a conventional uh, film in in a cinema, and you you lose the aspect ratio uh, for, yeah. for some some reason, then if you wanted that 70 millimeter look then i then in theory then you should have just gone for a, a slightly wide angle let a wider angle lens at the point of shooting and you would then get that same viewpoint well but, you hmm. well i think you'd uh, well you'd get the you'd get the physical view viewpoint right but i don't think you get you don't get the depth of it being shot on 70 millimeter, which looks very different projected. I mean, you can, yeah. you can see it. I mean, I exactly. And yeah. We, we're in, we're in agreement here. And the point yeah. is if you go on a wide, if you'd used a wider angle, you would have had to have moved closer to the subject matter. Otherwise you would have pushed the people further back within the shot. Wait, you guys are talking about different things. Yeah. Um, that's not the same thing. Right. That's a large format analogy. Johnny is essentially talking about that increase in sort of pop that you get when you use large format versus say 35 millimeter film. Right. Right. It's a, ultimately it's a, it's a, re, it's a resolution thing, but yes. the, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Simon, you're talking about um, the, your field of view and your perspective, but it, as soon as you move the camera position, your perspective is going to change. Yeah. So you, right. you yeah. can't move the camera and use a wider lens and get the same perspective. It's not going to look the same. I agree. But right. what you are saying is that if you're using a smaller format, right, then you need to use a wider lens to get the same field of view. Exactly. Or yeah. a shorter focal length lens, rather. Right. 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 So, like, it, a, a good example would be go watch a Wes Anderson film. 
Ugh. where where he shoots he shoots pretty much everything with the same i don't know if it's 28 millimeter but he he shoots you know it's these very wide shots that have a lot going on in them they have a very particular look right which is really different than if you another film that came out recently shot in 70 millimeter which i saw in 70 millimeter is the quentin tarantino film um the once upon a time in in hollywood um in you know again in 70 what's that it's not out here yet i'm waiting Oh, it's not out there yet. Well, that's because of the whole China thing. They, I think he's refusing to recut it for... No, Hong Kong well, is different. A, yeah, that doesn't affect you, but he's refusing to recut And I wonder if that's affecting it. It's worldwide anyway, mm-hmm. whatever. We just have um, to get films a little bit later. But, okay. Yeah. Well, it's worth seeing. But, but seeing stuff that's actually shot in 70 millimeter projected onto a 70 millimeter screen, I mean, that's why the, these filmmakers are choosing to do that because the amount of the amount of information resolution wise that you get in the frame, if you actually, you know, view it in the intended format is like, it's, it's bonkers. Yeah. Um, I, I have a strip of that, an actual movie that's in 70 mil. And it looks like you're looking at like, I don't know, six, four by five. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, right. Key frame. And that's 24 yeah. times a second. I mean, one <laughs> roll of film, I think last, like when they did the, uh, the stuff where they carried the camera to the top of, you know, Mount Everest or whatever, those things yeah. I think could only shoot one or two minutes and then you'd have to change the magazine because it's ripping through there. I mean, 35 millimeter film <laughs> runs through the camera at 90 feet per minute. So I don't, I didn't do the math on what 70 goes through, but it's ripping. But you know, also 70 millimeter film is, is 3.5 times larger negative yeah. area. So that goes <laughs> like anything else. It's like when you shoot something with four by five and you shoot something 35. Right. Yeah, you know, and it's just it's amazing. Massive. So the, the the resolution of that stuff is just, you know, it's higher resolution. I'm sure that all adds to the effect. Hey, Johnny, dumb question. Uh, that's yeah. film you're watching projected, right? Yes, or that's did you? actually film, not digital. Wow, projection. I didn't even know they did that anymore. That's it's awesome. one of so the music box in Chicago is one of I think five or six theaters in the country that is still <laughs> set up to project 70 millimeter film. Yeah. You know, I think there's one like in the through style. the camera <laughs> through yeah. the projector. So. Yeah, there was a big one for a long time in Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to remember if that's still around because I used to live near there. Well, so right. Well, I'm just thinking we, we need to start to bring things uh, to an end. I know that we can talk about carry on talking about this for for a while. Um, just a, a quick question: Am I any closer to being right? By the way, <laughs> no. I'd say yes. Yeah, that's that's good enough for me. Uh, <laughs> so then, um, Bill, uh, thank you for for being with us today. It's been absolutely fascinating. There's just so much that we've learned. It's funnily enough, I, I I think I mentioned earlier. I, I've I re-listened to the episode uh, with, we had with Matthew Duclos, and I I can't believe just how much stuff I'd actually forgotten or didn't even take in at the time. And I think I'm going to have to do exactly the same uh, with 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 this show because there are so many things that we've we've covered there that are completely new to me so uh, i'm sure they'll be new to a lot of people as well so thank you very much for patiently explaining things in the way that you've done because i think you've explained things very very well today yeah i think uh, matt, matt duclos is a massive amount of knowledge that that guy just is is amazing and i think i touch more on the the closer to the the people that are shooting cheaply <laughs> in the field because <laughs> that's what i always did my whole life but no i, I appreciate that very much simon no oh, well, it's, it's, it's been great to have you on the show um it's fantastic and uh we'll I'll, i'm going to come back to you and just say if there's let uh, give you the opportunity to uh, um let people know how they can find some of your work and things like that but uh, i just want to go over to uh, to the guys because uh, one thing i'm going to say we, we we're not going to do any uh, we have got some emails, but we're going to wait for another week. In fact, we'll probably do those next week. Um, so are there any other things you might quickly want to get off your chest, Perry? Uh, no. No, other than uh, thank you, Bill. That that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah. So, and uh, so how about yourself then, Johnny? Uh, are we doing are do, we're doing shout-outs in effect yeah, then? That, yeah, that effect. Okay, yeah. so I, I have I have two um, and we mentioned the term otaku earlier, which we'll get into, I think, more on a future uh, podcast as we are ever seeking to expand the lexicon of the classic lenses world. Uh, but I, I want to thank uh, Hong Lee, who is a, 
a customer at Central Camera who came in and he came in and said, you know, if you guys ever decide to rebrand Classic Lenses podcast, you should use the word otaku. And he went on to, to, to describe um, this as being basically coming from the anime world, but it's basically being a uber super geek with yeah. uh, excessive amounts of knowledge and passion for a specific topic, which probably does describe us. Uh, so thank you, Hong Lee, for, for that, for that reference. Um, and then I want to also another mention, um, another central camera customer. Um, it's more like, I, I didn't even call them customers. They're like regulars because they're just like, they come in to hang out sometimes and they don't get anything. They just come in and chat, which is great. Um, but, uh, WD Floyd, who is a regular at central camera company, um, he has the cover this week of the Chicago Reader uh, with an article called, it's really a photo essay called Ode to the Green Line uh, here in Chicago. And it is an amazing um, set of photos. And he's he's using pretty much all film gear. And I, I probably know what he was using here, but I won't talk, talk about it because I'm not 100% sure. But I probably know what stuff he was using shooting these shots. Um, but they look really fantastic. So uh, congrats on that D for the, again, in the cover of the reader. Um, great, great photo series. I'll put a, I'll put a link, uh, to that in the podcast notes. Okay. That's, that's, that's great. Um, so, so Bill, um, you've already mentioned earlier that you're not all over the place on social media and things like that. Are there, are there any places that, uh, how, if, if somebody wanted to talk to you or, uh, know a bit more about the business that you're involved in and things like that, it, 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 could you uh, point them in a direction? Well, sure. I mean, like I said earlier, I have a website that there's really nothing on it. And, and so this might be a good time for it to start up. I think I could get a message through that. That's ilovelenses.com. Good name. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. I love lenses. And uh, like I say, I need to start doing that sort of thing. It's just that the real world stuff gets in the way. <laughs> and, you know, you're... you're doing sound for movies or, or whatever teaching. And the next thing you know, a few years have gone by, but yes, they, they could probably contact me through that. And then if you want to see some of my credits, you know, I, I got a, a couple dozen credits there on IMDb. Uh, it's under W S Pavetta W S P I V E T T A at IMDb. And you could look at some of the stuff I've recently worked on. And then can I do a couple sh shout outs? Absolutely. Please do. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. The, ga the, the gang at visual products in Wellington, Ohio, outside of Cleveland. They're the best. Uh, they're the guys that got me into the mess that I'm in today. <laughs> I, I actually call my company down here, visual products South, because I've got so much stuff that uh, just walls and walls full of cases and, and lenses and tripods and lights. It's, it's crazy. And then also the guys over at ball photo in Asheville, Nice little camera shop here in Asheville and super nice folks and can't go in there without spending at least 30 or $40. Yeah. Oh, that's, so. that's, that's great. Well, well, Bill, it's been great having you on the show. So th thank you. Thank you again. And uh, there were so many things that we haven't spoke about. So I, I get the feeling you will be back. It's a, oh. uh, it's a future point. We could do a part oh, two. That would be delightful. Yeah. Yes, uh, please. Um, right then, so uh, Perry, how can people keep up with the things that you're up to outside of this show? Uh, you can find me on Instagram or Flickr at Perry G. Uh, and if you want to see my website that never gets updated, you can go to PerryG.com. Excellent. And Johnny? <laughs> uh, you can find my never updated Instagram account at uh, System Photography. At, at, I'm sorry, at, at System Photography on Instagram. Uh, and you can find me at uh, Central Camera Company in Chicago. Cool. And if you want to get in touch with the show, what's the best way? Um, send us an email at classiclensespodcast at gmail.com. Uh, and, of course, visit the podcast website at classiclensespodcast.com. Visit the YouTube version of Classic Lenses Podcast on YouTube. I think you probably just go to YouTube and type Classic Lenses Podcast. Yeah, that works. Okay. Uh, and also, of course, catch up with the, uh, the latest rundown of each episode uh, uh, with the, that is done by our friends over on Instagram um, at Best Vintage Lens. 
So check out Best Vintage Lens on Instagram. And I, I've got a photo on there. They featured one of my photos. Oh, yeah, today. they did. They featured, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's such a great shot, too. So, we didn't even get to talk about the new the new stuff, the new lens, but in next week, maybe. Next week, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah, yes. next week. Def, definitely. Lo- loads to talk about next week. So, uh, but yeah, and uh, so thanks, thanks for picking my photo there, there Ricardo. Appreciate that. It's very good of you. Um, and so if you want to follow me, I'm on Instagram as Simon Forster Photographic. I'm on Twitter as Simon Four. Um, that's enough really, isn't it? Um, other things, uh, I want to say thank you to Anonymous, um, who donated something to us, uh, this week. So thank you very much, Anon. Um, and also Robbie J has uh, made a donation as well. And he's put a little smiley emoji thing, um, on our coffee page. <laughs> Um, so if uh, anybody does want to uh, help us out, we are on Coffee, uh, which is ko-fi.com. Um, if you do a search for Classic Lenses Podcast, you'll find our page. So uh, any donations will be gratefully accepted. So, uh, But thank you uh, for those who have donated this week. Um, other things, just in a few minutes, you will hear M from Emulsif, who has a message for you. Because uh, last week I mentioned uh, the Emulsif Secret Santa Secret Santa Night 2019 uh, is almost upon us, and you only have until the end of this month to register register for that. So uh, there's there's a reasonable amount of time, but those days are going quickly. So uh, have a listen to the the message from M, and uh, also go over to emulsif.org. And somewhere on there, there'll be Secret Santa or just type in Secret Santa and you'll, you'll find uh, the, the details and the, you'll be able to take part in an analog photography based film swap. Or I say film swap, it could be anything that's analog based. I mean, last year, um, I think I sent out a photo book uh, to Israel uh, along with a few other bits and bobs. So it's, uh, um, it's a fun thing and you never know what you're going to get. And I got some great stuff. So um, it's well worth giving that a go. Um, finally, uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com, who, who um, is behind our music, which is Octo Blues. And that's it. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, this week's show. And if you can, be like Carl. Wonderful. Sweet. Uh, that was great. That was great. I loved oh. hearing you say that. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah I, i'm so i feel like i never got to actually meet carl but for some reason you know i don't know i just i feel he's around all the time i, I think about uh, yeah. him and his cameras and the stories because you know i've listened to the show since the beginning and so and re-listened to several of them and uh that voice is already fading and i so every once in a while you gotta listen to it just to remember so uh so yeah it's um he's, he's missed there's no two ways about it mm. yeah but we love perry so uh, don't worry about yeah when, when we say nice things about uh, cold perry <laughs> we're, 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 not, we're not like saying oh we're stuck with perry now oh no no of course of course <laughs> i i really like listening to old episodes as well you know he's, yeah he's he's sorely missed well i wasn't yeah. sure how i was gonna like you perry <laughs> 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 but after two shows then i, I was hooked oh thank and, you uh, yeah yeah and you you totally you look totally different though. you know i mean i just you you sound i don't know you're you're the hip guy well johnny is too sorry about that simon no no johnny's <laughs> way too old to have that you that word used in anywhere near him <laughs> <laughs> I tried not to say like. I don't think I did. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, everyone, and greetings from my super secret hiding facility here in one of the bathrooms at Emulsive HQ. It's M, um, and I would like to talk to you about Secret Santa 2019. We kicked off on October 1st, currently sitting at around about 760 players in a little under 50 countries and I'd really like the whole community to jump on and and play along. This year is the fifth year. Um, Registration carries on until the very end of this month, October 31st. And if you want to sign up, all you have to do is to go to Emulsive, have a look at the super annoying red bar when you load the page and click on the article link 
or you can just search for Emulsive Santa 2019 and, uh, and find the informational article there. So it's got everything that you need. You can go ahead, find out what it's all about, how it works, how you can go ahead and register, and really importantly, what kind of responsibilities you have as a responsible member of the community sending gifts to another friend that you haven't just met yet. Anyway, thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, um, sign up. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.